The city of Chicago is 186 years old. And in those 186 years, only two women have ever been elected to serve as mayor, and neither of those women was elected to a second term. So what's it like to be a woman who wants to seek elected office? And what are the challenges women leaders face? I'm Andrea Zopp. This is Chicago Newsroom 2.0. Join me as I seek some answers to these questions. We'll be right back with our first guest. As we get older or deal with disabilities, the issues we face can be isolating and overwhelming. With often limited income, these populations have very little support for legal assistance. This week on Change Agents, we will meet a Chicago organization who has been working for almost 40 years to serve these populations. Join us this Thursday at 7 p.m. on CanTV 19 or download and watch on the brand new CanTV Plus app. Many times we hear about this idea that women need to lean in or move forward towards leadership despite the challenges or risks that doing so may pose. But why should being a woman in leadership be risky? Here to share her perspective on what it takes to be a woman who leads is Casey Atayero. Casey is the Chief External Affairs Officer of the Joyce Foundation, where she oversees a variety of communications initiatives and grants. Casey, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Let's start and just level set for sure. our audience. Tell us a little bit about the Joyce Foundation and its work in Chicago and the Great Lakes region. Sure, so the Joyce Foundation is a private philanthropy that invests in public policy strategies across a variety of program areas, really focused on improving the quality of life for people in the Great Lakes region. Um, for 75 years, um, it's actually our anniversary year this year. Oh, wow. Yes, um, we've really been focused on trying to tackle some of the most pressing challenges facing our region, from you know access to quality education, to environment, to creating safer communities, to creating a more representative democracy. And we do all of this work with the idea of creating you know, fertile ground so that the residents of our region will be better positioned to be successful in school, work, and life. Oh, wow, it's a lot. It's a lot, <laughs> yes. Uh, so tell us a little bit about your role mm -hmm. and what you do there. Sure, so in my role as Chief External Affairs Officer, I oversee the Foundation Strategic Communications, our journalism program, and our Lend a Hand Community Grants Fund. All right, terrific. And yes. you've been there five years? Five years, yes, yes. Terrific. And what's been, so for you, what's been the most exciting and mm. positive or, and or challenging? Yes, um, I would say that there's been so many things. You know, I'm really fortunate to work with such dynamic, passionate people who really are committed to making our region work better for the people who live here. So that's just a really inspiring place to be. Um, but as of late, I would say um, our Linda Hand Community Grants Fund has really been just such a rewarding experience. Um, it's hard to believe it's been three years since the beginning of the pandemic. and. Um, you know, we at that time experienced the devastating impacts of both COVID and civil unrest in a lot of our communities in Chicago, particularly on the South and West Sides. And it was a moment in which anyone who was in a position to do something really had an obligation to. And so we started what we thought was going to be a temporary fund because we all thought COVID was gonna be temporary. And um, we were really focused on helping community organizations that were helping the community either get PPE or access to testing, or more life supports like rent or um, food assistance. But as the nature of the pandemic evolved, the fund evolved, and we really pivoted towards recovery, both from COVID but also focusing on some of the longer term impacts of systemic racism and disinvestment that COVID brought to the fore. And you, you spearheaded this fund and it's getting it up yeah. and running. So tell us a little bit about how it works. Yeah, well, first it was, it was very much a team effort. Um, it was a whole foundation effort that was really focused again on investing in the community in a new way for us. And, you know, we all got together and sourced some community organizations that we knew were really, you know, carrying a lot of the weight and wanted to figure out ways that we could help them. And the fund is very participatory. Like, we seek um, feedback from the community on organizations that are doing good work that we should be supporting. And I'm very proud to say in the past three years, we've uh, awarded $3 million wow. in grants to 50 community organizations that are really doing heroic work in our community, and but we're always you know, looking to new, meet new people and learn about new organizations. So folks should go to our website, JoyceFDN.org, to find out more about Linda Hand and to nominate an organization that you think we should support. Terrific. Joyce, 
JoyceFDN.org. Terrific. And um, just is there, do you have a particular favorite story or that came out of the, the Lend a Hand Fund that, that you, know, you want to talk about the mm -hmm. impact that really to, you know, to you shows why this work is so important? Mm -hmm. I know I sprang that question. No, no, no. On you, but you know what? I'm a journalist. I got to roll with it, right? It's all good. Um, you know, I would say what struck me the most was the generosity of spirit of the leaders of these organizations. And when we would talk to them about their work, we would ask, are there other organizations that we should know about? And like right away, they'd recommend, well, if you're thinking about this, support this person, when they weren't even guaranteed to get funding from us. And I think it was just so indicative of the tremendous wealth of leadership in our communities and just really big hearts and generosity of spirit of these folks that they were doing more than they expected to with less than they needed and they still took a moment to recommend that someone else get support too and it just really is the best of us and it was just it was just so wonderful to have that happen over and over again with every call that we did. What a see that's why it, that was what a powerful way to describe that and also to make people recognize yeah. that these community organizations they're not fighting with each other no. even though they have limited resources mm -hmm. they work together they work together and they respect what each the impact that each other is having. So Absolutely. Thank, thank you for sharing that. Absolutely. That was terrific. Um, and so let, you're also the co-sponsor, Joyce's, yes. of the acclaimed Soul of Philanthropy exhibit, yes. which is a very powerful exhibit about black philanthropic giving. Tell us a little bit about the exhibit and why it is so important yeah. to have giving from the black community, mm. black philanthropy, why it matters. Yeah. Um, you know, having black leadership at philanthropic organizations like Joyce is really important because we need to have the perspectives and needs of our community represented at the board table when funding decisions are made. Um, but what I love about the Soul of Philanthropy is that it spotlights, again, that generosity of spirit of everyday black Chicagoans that are pouring into their communities with everything they have to have this city live up to its promise to its people. You right. know? It's very powerful. Right? And yeah, it's just a really, really powerful thing. And, it also, in a very important way, is sort of redefining who a philanthropist is. You know, like the grandmother in the neighborhood who opens up her home after school as a safe haven for kids with snacks and hugs, she's a philanthropist, you know? The barber who's offering free back to school haircuts, you know, he's a philanthropist too. You know, and all of the neighbors who sort of quietly notice other neighbors in need and show up with food or clothes or a ride to the store, they're philanthropists too. Right. You know, and that's, I think, the great thing about this exhibit and just what was, I think, indicative, again, of just the, the great heart of this city is that there are so many people in quiet ways every day who are just showing up to do what needs to be done without a lot of fanfare, you know, recognition, and certainly not a lot of resources. And the best part of this job is being able to support people like that. Right. This is a, such a great point about making clear the, about the face of philanthropy mm -hmm. and what it looks like because people hear philanthropy mm -hmm. and they think big institutions yes. and Rockefeller yeah. and the foundation. And they don't realize that it, philanthropy means is, is, is really begins mm -hmm. at the local level. Yeah, the definition of philanthropy is contributing to the welfare of others. Right. Wow. You know? Terrific. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. So I want to talk a little bit about you. Okay, sure. So you're uh, an award-winning reporter and journalist. <laughs> mm -hmm. You led communications for Congresswoman Robin Kelly. So tell us a little bit. And also, you were at the governor's office. I was. And the treasurer's office. I've had a lot of jobs, Andy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I bet I can beat that number. <laughs> you probably I'm can. reasonably <laughs> certain I can beat you. Um, but <laughs> so, um, but let's tell us a little bit about that, that little bit about that journey mm. and what you've learned and because yeah. that's communications in a wide variety a lot of, of different settings. ways yeah you know I thought that I was going to be a journalist forever like you know in theory I think it's still the best job in the world like you get paid to be curious right um, but you know at the time you know when I was thinking about sort of next steps and the industry was really turbulent and I, I started to think about ways I could use my journalism skills to deal, still do mission driven work and so I said way to politics and I worked for several elected officials and it was a really great opportunity to connect with constituents, to demystify the government and politics process for constituents and to really have an important conversation with them about our democracy. And I really, really enjoyed it, but I mean, I'm sure you, as you can relate, 
Working for four elected officials is a lot, you know, and it was time to make a change. And when the opportunity to join the Joyce team presented itself, you know, the more that I dug into both the depth and breadth of the investments that they're making to improve people's lives, it was like, that that's a place I want to be. Right. But yeah. how powerful, telling the stories from the newspaper sector yeah. to the private to the private sector to the public sector and now to the non for profit sector. Yeah. That's leading and yeah. real and really having a voice. And so thank you for taking the time to come visit with me. Oh, I you. hope you'll think about coming back. Of course. Uh, we really appreciate your time and your perspective. We'll be right back after this. When it comes to managing your money, the sooner you know what you're doing, the better. That's why this week we're talking all about kids and money. Well, of course you gotta look at the price, but then you've gotta be like, how much will I need? If you have an older child, you wanna think about maybe assisting them as their family grows. Tune in this Thursday at 7.30 p.m. on CanTV19, CanTV.org, and on the brand new CanTV Plus app. Would you believe me if I told you that Chicago was nearly 135 years old before the first women joined the city council? Well, that's true. Chicago established its first version of a city council back in 1837, but it wasn't until 1971 that the city's governing body welcomed its first women aldermen. Couple that with the fact that Chicago's only two women mayors in its 186-year history, and both of those women lost their bids for re-election. One has to ask the question, is Chicago a tough town for women in politics? Well, here to help us answer that question are three women who'd know better than most of us. Please help me welcome to our roundtable discussion political consultant Del Marie Cobb, Cook County Commissioner Josina Morita, and candidate for 48th Ward, Alderperson, Lenny Mana Hoppenworth. Welcome, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to start with my first question that I've told you is always my current bug. We've had two women mayors in our 186-year history in this city. Neither one of them won their bids for re-election. What does that say about us? Is it that, was it them as candidates, or was it that we just still have issues with powerful women leading? Uh, Del Marie, I'm gonna start with you as our veteran. Well, I think it's a little bit of both. Uh, first of all, uh, you know, as a woman, it's gonna be tough, and that there's a double standard. But on the other hand, um, you've got to live up to the candidate. You run, you know, running for office and governing are two different things. But you can't be one person when you're running and then get into office and be somebody else. And so your constituents, one of the reasons they vote for women in both cases, Jane Byrne and Lori Lightfoot, is because people want change. They're, they're betting that you're going to be different, that you're going to bring reform. And then when you get in office and you're more the same, then the tolerance level is very different. So that's what happened in both cases with Jane Byrne and it happened with Lori Lightfoot. I mean, I think there is a double standard and it is hard, right? Because I think sometimes women get elected because people want change and they say that that's what they want, but people's tolerance for that oftentimes is much smaller uh, than, than they would like to believe. And I think that those two women had very particular personalities. They also had very particular challenges in their terms. I mean, look at what Lori Lightfoot had to just deal with over the last four years. It's unprecedented. Um, you know, so I think it's a combination of, you know, their personalities, their campaign styles, in addition to some of the challenges that they faced as women leaders in particular, but also a lot of what was going on in the city at the time um, that made it very challenging. Lenny, how about you? As you're, as you're seeking office, what do you think about what could be the expectations of people as you're running versus the expectations of you as an, uh, as an elected official? I'm very excited to be a candidate for 48th Ward because I feel the 48th Ward is one of the most densely populated and diverse wards in Chicago. And they do say at the door that they're ready for change. And I have been um, deeply rooted in my values for a very long time working in the community. And I want to be that same person when I sit in city council. That's my promise to myself and my family and to the effect of the mayor's Lightfoot 
Absolutely. We, who knew that the pandemic was going to hit us? And those are unprecedented times. People at the door are ready for change. They don't want to go back. They want to move forward. And I want to be on that city council moving forward with the new mayor. Great points. But, you know, I want to circle back, Delmarie, to something you said, which is, you know, people have expectations of you as a candidate. And it is different, you know, and, and uh, certainly... Uh, Commissioner Marita, you know this. It is different actually being in the role than running for the role. But don't you think that the bar is different? I, I wonder if the bar is different. We tolerate more, just like you know, we know as, as women of color, that oftentimes the bar is different. Yes, there's a bar, but it's different for people of color or for women. That's, to me, what I'm really getting at. You're right. It is harder when you don't live up to what everybody says. But elected officials, male, male elected officials, don't live up to what they said they were going to do all the time and manage to get reelected. And so I'm well, just wondering how well, you balance that. No, I agree. And that's why I said it's a double standard, and we all know that. Um, you know, we're not, we're not spring chickens. And so we've been out here a long time. We know that there is a strike against you if you're a woman. There's two strikes against you if you're black and a woman. So you already know that going in. You can't suddenly get in office and then be surprised by that. You have navigated, if you're in office, you have navigated the majority of your life, those two things. So when you get in office, you already know going in that that's where the bar is. So now you've got to figure out how do I succeed at what I'm doing, not make enemies, because again, the threshold is very low. You know, if you do one thing, you're going to make an enemy, whereas for men, you're strong. For women, you're difficult. And that's the difference, and you already know that. So you've got to navigate that all the while you're in office. So, Commissioner, you face this, this double standard that we're talking about. How do you, uh, and yet you've built strong relationships. You built, you work, you started as commissioner in the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District, a, a very much male environment. Tell us how do you navigate those waters in terms of of recognizing that the, there is a double standard, but still being an effective leader and, per, and governor in your role. MWRD was, you know, historically known as a very male-dominated space, but people forget that when I was there, it was a majority woman board. It was actually a majority woman of color board. And by the time I left, it was a black woman-led board. And so I think sometimes when you go into office, when you're campaigning, it's very independent. It's between you and the voters, right? But when you go into government, you have staff, and you have an institution that is used to doing things a certain way for a very long time, right? So the change that maybe voters want is not necessarily the change that the institution wants. And so you do. You have to figure out how to navigate that. And I always say, you know, your leadership style has to be based on who you are, right? So I'm an, you know, I was the first Asian American um, at MWRD. I'm the first Asian American woman on the Cook County Board. There is a unique positioning um, that I have to figure out how to navigate. And it's new for everybody. It's new for me. It's new for the staff. Um, I notice in board meetings, right, they'll talk about black and Latino, and then they peek over at me, and they're like, oh, and Asians, too. <laughs> uh, right? It's all new. It's also different being younger, uh, you know, being a mom. I'm, you know, I, have a, I was the first woman in 130 years at MWRD uh, to be a commissioner and have a baby while in office. They had never had to deal with maternity leave, lactation rooms, you know, all of these things that, you know, in the workplace, you know, you would think in, in 2018 when I first had my baby would be very routine. So there's a lot of adjusting that I think we're going through right now between what the public wants, what voters expect, uh, the kind of people who are running for office being very different that changes the dynamic, but also institutions and, you know, government institutions in particular that are very slow to change. And so you have to figure out that balance. How do you push here but step back here? How do you build those relationships when you're new? Um, how do you build that trust with staff and with others and, and still continue to deliver on what you promised as a candidate? So, Lenny, I think um, you know, we're, we're highlighting this, this dichotomy between getting elected and actually governing. How are you thinking about that you know, as, you, as you're finishing your camp, you're coming into the run, up to the runoff uh, and on April 5th, which will be here soon? Um, and, uh, and, but how do you think about that as when you, if you have the opportunity to become the older person, how are you going to think about governing and aligning yourselves with Lenny the candidate versus Lenny the alder person. 
Yeah, and I do believe that running for office is the first time I have run for office, but I have been told, and I believe it, that running for office is one thing, and then governing is another. And so I look to people who have been doing the work to learn from their experiences and to bring my own experiences as also a mother, as a person of color, as a daughter of Filipino immigrants, as a local business owner. And to bring that perspective, I think is what is exciting to a lot of people that I've been talking to, especially young people, especially people who live in the ward, who live in Uptown, Asia on Argyle, including um, young people who go to Loyola, and they want to see themselves in government, they want a seat at the table, um, and they want to see somebody who can represent their their voice and not just the status quo, which is, um, you know, a very white male dominated industry, basically. Um, um, so I'm, I'm very excited that I was able to break through a field of 10 um, to, to get into the runoff. And now um, the work is that when I become an elected official to keep bringing those voices to the table. And that is that is really the challenge to make sure that we are in touch with the voters every single day. And it's going to take a, a structure. So it's not just me, it's also who I hire and how I set up my office and how we set up communications that's going to keep me in office, keep me in touch with the voters and the constituents that I represent, and not just the voters, but everybody who lives there, no matter what their status is. Do you think that there are something, particular skills or strengths that you have as a woman that have been particularly helpful to you as you've been running? So. As a woman, as a mother, as a mother of three teenagers. I mean, Ooh, okay, well, right there. Okay, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> yeah, you have to negotiate all the time. I mean, I, I'm a renter, and we have a three-bedroom and one bath five people and so just negotiating time in the morning to get out the door you know all of that just takes a lot of patience and kindness and compassion and you know seeing seeing them for who they are too and watching them grow and giving them the space to grow um, and also being there when they need me um, not imposing myself on them but um, hearing who they are and that's that's me as a retail business owner too when somebody walks in the door I don't tell them what they need. <laughs> I have to listen. I have to hear them and what they need and what their issue is. And that's the same thing as a local older person's job, is to, to have, firstly, an office that's an access accessible office for people, um, a phone that people can call and know that I'm going to pick up, and or someone in the office is going to pick up and be responsive to, and to listen to people, and to build coalitions across the ward, including with block clubs and neighborhood business owners and also uh, nonprofits who live in the ward. Um, we have to work together is really what it is. And it's about building community and it starts from the ground up. I'm excited to do that. I've been doing that for a long time as a, as a community organizer and as a mother too, I'll bring that perspective. As a, as a woman business owner, I'll bring that perspective. As a woman who sits on the Chamber of Commerce in one of the most LGBTQ friendly neighborhoods in, um, in, the, in, the, in Chicago and one of the neighborhoods that was deemed as the second coolest neighborhood in the <laughs> world to live in. But it's not just that, and we can't just be cool. We have to be as welcoming as possible because we know that there are a lot of people suffering and um, we can bring that voice to the table Although, if we center people who have been sitting on the margins for so long, right. including women. Although I, I'm just going to say, I think being cool helps. But <laughs> not that I would actually know, but I believe that rumor has it that it has. So, but uh, Commissioner, you've had to run in both countywide and then in your district. So, is there things that you've brought to the table as a candidate, uh, as a as a woman, that you think really helped or made a difference to you for you? Yeah, I mean it's. The, I live in the north suburbs. My district is the north suburbs, Skokie, Evanston, Rogers Park. And you look at this area, we've gone through some dramatic change demographically and in terms of leadership, right? Uh, I am the first woman to hold the, the seat in the 13th district on the county board. I'm also, with my other hat on, I'm the first woman committee person in Niles Township, the first Asian American woman committee person ever in Cook County. And so there's a lot of breaking down these different barriers and relationships. There is a different 
different way that women govern. There's a different way that I govern as somebody who's younger with kids coming from a community that has been kind of, you know, told for so long that statistically you don't matter. We don't know how to serve you. We don't see you. And so that relationship and that experience translates to a lot of other communities across my district. And so, you know, it is one of those things that you have to figure out how to redefine the role. Um, you know, I don't think, we, we don't run to office to try to compromise ourselves to fit a mold. And so it becomes a balancing act of how do I figure out how to come as my whole self, but be able to relate to every different experience and perspective and expectation. And I think that there is something about being a woman that makes you adaptable and self-aware and compassionate um, that kind of builds in some of those skills to be able to do it across such a diverse district. We've now talked a lot about the challenges that women leaders face and the difference between governing and running and governing. Let's talk a little bit about how do we, do you think we have a, a great pool of women candidates? I mean, I, you know, I see you both here and we had a, certainly had a lot in the race, but to me it still feels like not enough. I mean, we're very blessed, in, certainly in Cook County, but not enough, right? It, it, it still feels to me. I don't know, Delmar, you've been doing this for a, a little bit. Um, <laughs> what's your perspective? And, and what do we, if you think not enough, what do we do to get more? Well, you know, we're lucky enough to be in a city and state where we do have a lot of women in office and we have a lot of women at the head as the head of the office. So they're not not just in the rank and file, but they actually are in charge. And so I think that makes a lot of us feel uh, we take it for granted to, to some degree. But it's still very difficult as a woman to run for office, uh, mainly because uh, women have a very hard time raising money and that hasn't changed. And they often say that you have to ask a woman seven times before she'll say yes, that she'll run for office. Whereas men, men think no matter who they are, they can run for office. I mean, they can, um, you know, nobody asked Rahm Emanuel, did he want to be mayor? He said, I'm gonna be mayor. Nobody asked uh, um, Barack Obama if he wanted to be a senator or a president. He said, I wanna be senator and I wanna be president because that's who men are. Uh, they already think that they can be whatever it is they want to be, whereas women have to be convinced that they can be that. And then when they jump in there, they have a very difficult time raising the money. Uh, people don't flock to them in the same way in terms of giving them money. And so a lot of women, just knowing that is going to be an obstacle, take themselves out of the race. Right. And I see that all the time. Um, so, you know, I have a... Um, I have a PAC uh, that I created for African American women for that very reason, and uh, it was it was to make sure that we were able to raise money to help uh, African American women who are progressive run for office. But even as a person who has a PAC, it's very difficult raising right. the money. Thank you so much for coming and sharing with our audience tonight, and I really appreciate each of you. Uh, and I'm sorry that we have to we're, we have run out of time. We'll be sharing, I'll be back sharing my closing thoughts right after this. I'm Melissa Donaldson and I like to call myself a curious boomer. Through that curiosity, I have found that when we engage with people from different generations, we are more alike than we are different. On Generation Flex, we will discuss the day's most interesting topics and discover each other's unique perspectives together. Join us Mondays at 7 p.m. on CanTV19, CanTV.org, and on the new CanTV Plus app. Chicago's a tough town for anyone running for office. It's probably fair to say, though, that women face some unique challenges when they decide to step up and lead. Be it politics or businesses, the way to overcome those obstacles is by doing exactly what we did today. Gather a group of smart, tough women together and share experiences, victories, and even failures among one another to develop strategies and consensus on the best ways to move forward. If we can do that at any time, we can advance every time. Thank you, Chicago. See you next time.